Welcome to lecture 8, section 2.2, .2, which is organizing quantitative data. Okay, so quantitative as usual, more with the numbers. In summarizing quantitative data, first, we determine whether the data are discrete or continuous. If the data are discrete with relatively few different values of the variable, then categories of data called classes will be the observations. If the data are discrete but with many different class values of the variables or if the data are continuous, then the categories of data of the classes must be created using intervals of numbers. Small table here, please take out of so we will first present the techniques for organizing discrete quantitative data when there are relatively few different values and then proceed to organize continuous quantitative data. Sorry, another typo. Okay, so let's take a look at first objective, organize discrete data in tables. So for example one, below are the number of customers who arrive at the Waimanala feed supply store for, and I should have fixed this on your notes, for 20 20 randomly selected 15 minute intervals. So someone sat there for 20 different 15 minute intervals and counted the number of people that showed up. For example, in one 15 minute interval, two people showed up. In another one, seven people showed up. So we're going to construct a frequency and relative frequency table for the following data. All right, so let's see. Let's do number of customers. And then from there, we're going to do frequency, so F, and then RF for relative frequency. So for the number of customers, it goes between 1 and what's the highest number we see? 8. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and write down 1 to 8. And then the frequency, so how many times we see each of these? So for the frequency, how many times do we see one? We only see one twice. And then how many times do we see two? Four times. Okay, you can go ahead and pause the video and try count these out by yourself. I'll go ahead and just keep working on this. So we said there were four of the two. And then of three, let's see, one, two, three, four, four of three again. Four, how did you see a four? One, two, only two fours. How many do we see of fives? Oh, just one five. How many sixes? One, two, three, three sixes. Sevens, one, two, three, three sevens. And eight, one, eight. All right, so let's go ahead and count up. To, in order to do our relative frequencies, remember we're going to divide by the number of frequencies we have, so let's add this up. Two plus four plus four plus two plus one plus three plus three plus one, which would be 20. Or you could just see what we had in the beginning, which is 20. Okay, so the total, 20. And uh, relative frequency, so this is going to be 2 divided by 20. So, 2 divided by 20, 0 0.1. 4 divided by 20, and so on. I'll go ahead and write these down, and you, hopefully, will pause the video and work on these by yourself, and then check back in with me. Oops, I did those two wrong. That's 3 divided by 20. Okay, so 4 divided by 20, 0 0.2. 0 0.2 again. 2, we already did that. 1, we haven't done. 3, we haven't done.
and one we have done, which is 0 0.05. All right, so we have our relative frequencies. All right, now let's answer this question. On the basis of relative frequencies, what percentage of the 15 minute intervals had three customers? So the number of customers being three is right here. And the percentage, we can convert that to percentage. 0 0.2 converted into percentage would be, let's see, 0. Point, oops, 0. 0.2 is a percent. We can do that to be 20 over 100, which equals 20%. So the answer would be, what percentage of the 15 minute intervals had three customers? 20% of the 15 minute intervals had three customers. As usual, when you have a word question, you should answer in word form, and it could, should be a complete sentence, including that period at the end. That is something I will be asking on exams, so if you are asked to answer in a complete sentence, please answer in a complete sentence, including the period. Why including the period? We're in college. We can write a period. Okay, so objective two, construct histograms of discrete data. All right, by definition, a histogram is constructed by drawing rectangles for each class of data. The height of each rectangle is the frequency, or relative frequency, of the class. The width of the rectangle is the same, and the rectangles touch each other. So this is a little different than before. In this case, the rectangles touch each other. So for example two. But first before we do that, note the rectangles in histograms touch. But the rectangles in bar graphs, which we've done before, do not touch. Okay, so let's go ahead and construct a frequency histogram using the data in example one. So in example one, what data did we have? Well, let's go ahead and first I'm going to label this. We have number of customers. And then let's take a look. So we're looking at frequency. And for frequency and number of customers, actually I'm going to go ahead and move the F over a little bit. So number of customers and frequency. We had counted for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We had the frequency of 2. 4, 4, 2, 1, 3, 3, 1. All right, so number of customers goes from 1 to 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then for the frequency, it goes from 1 to 4 is the highest. So 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, let's go ahead and draw in our boxes for number of customers one. We had a frequency of two. Number of customers being two, we had a frequency of four. So it goes up to four. Not the best looking graph here, but let's go ahead and do that. For three, we also had four. For four, we had two. Five, we had one. Six was three. Okay, so notice the bars are touching each other for a histogram. And seven was three, as well as six, let's see, and eight was one. All right, and as usual, let's give this some color. It would all be one color in this case. I should have you guess the color. Next time I'll have you guess the color. Okay, so as usual, main difference between bar graphs and histograms. One of them touches the bar graph, and the other one, sorry, one of them touches, which is the histograms. The bar graphs do not touch. You can think of bar graphs as they are independent bars. All right, there we go. So now let's take a look at the next one. We're going to construct a table using the relative frequency. 
it's a relative frequency. And we have number of customers and relative frequency. So number of customers goes from 1 to 8. And relative frequency for 1 was 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. This are all the ones that I that we found before. Oh, sorry, relative frequency should not be down there. That should be number of customers. And this is relative. Whoops. Yeah, relative. Frequency. So number of customers, 1 to 8. And the frequencies. Let's see how to chart this. Looks kind of like they go in 0 0.05. So let's go ahead and do that. 0 0.05, 0 0.10. Oops. 0 0.15. Getting a little squishy here. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and erase my relative frequency. I have a side graph bar that has all of my tools on it, which means I'm not able to use the full extent of the left side. 0 0.5, 0 0.20, 0 0.25, and then let's just do 0 0.30. Okay, now let's go ahead and graph this. If you want to pause the video and try to graph it by yourself, you can go ahead and do that. One customer would be 0 0.1. Two customers was 0 0.2. Three customers was also 0 0.2. Four customers, 0 0.1. Five customers, 0 0.05. Six customers, 0 0.15. Remember, these are all pretty rough sketches. Uh, seven is also 0 0.15, just like six. And eight is 0 0.05. All right, guess which color I'm going to use. Yellow. If you're right, give yourself a pat on the back. Okay, let's go ahead and speed this up. Feel free to use your own colors when graphing. Um, if you're using, um, if you're taking the exam, try not to use things that are permanent when you're writing, but make sure it's dark enough so that if you're scanning your documents, your work is easily legible. All right, let's move on to objective three, organize continuous data in tables. Okay, so we have a few different terms here. We have lower class limit and upper class limit. What does this mean? Well, lower class limit is the smallest value within the class. And the class is the grouping of data. And the upper class limit is the largest value within the class. So right up here are categories into which data are grouped. And this is on page 76. So if you're trying to determine class width, which is a question that is commonly asked, what you're going to do is you're going to take the largest data value, subtract from it the smallest, and then divide by the number of classes you have in your data set. And then what you'll do is you'll round that up to a convenient number, which will depend on the data that you have. All right, so example three, the data to the right represents the top speed in kilometers per hour of all the players except the goaltenders in a certain soccer league. Find the following. A, the number of classes. Okay, so what we're looking at is how the data is grouped. The data is grouped in three ways. Speeds between these, speeds between 18 and 25.9, and speeds between 26 and 33.9 kilometers per hour. So we have three classes.
Now we want to find the class limits for the second class. So right here is the second class. And remember, the limits are the lowest and the largest number. So the lower class limit is 18. And the upper class limit is 25.9. So that wasn't too bad. Now we want to find the class width. So to do that, you're going to take, what did it say, the largest data value, which in our case would be 33.9. So let's do class width equals 33.9 minus the smallest data value, which would be 10. And we go ahead and color code this. and all divided by the number of classes, which would be all three. So the number of classes is three. Okay, let's go ahead and calculate this. 33.9 minus 10, that is gonna equal 22.9 divided by three. And that is approximately 7.63, which we're gonna go ahead and round up to Eight. So the class width is eight. Another way you can check the class width is just to see how you get from the lower class of the previous one to the lower class of the next one, which you would go by eight. Or to get from 18 to 26, you would also go by eight. But a uh, best way to do that or for the class width would be using this calculation. All right, exam, um, objective four, constructing histograms of continuous data. Okay, so a bit different. Now we're looking at continuous data. And we're gonna look at the chart provided. So we have one class, actually we have more than one class. We have a bunch of different classes here. And the relative frequency is already given for these classes. We don't have to find them ourselves. And we're asked to construct a histogram. Okay, so now we're looking at graphing a histogram when these values are no longer just a single integer. Now we have an actual class, which is different than when we were constructing histograms previously. In the previous example for objective two, we were just graphing items that had discrete data. For example, one customer, two customers, three customers. In this case, now we have continuous data. So let's take a look at how we would graph this. Well, what do we have? We have the class, which is five, five year rate of return. And let's see, that roughly goes Eight, nine, ten. Let's just go ahead and count it off in twos. And what is the relative frequency given? I'm going to move this over so I can write relative frequency. It looks like it's kind of in spacings of zero point. 0 0.05. So I'm going to go ahead and use that for when graphing. Zero point ten, zero point one five, zero point two zero, zero point two five, and zero point three zero. Okay, let's take a look at this. So from between eight to about 8.99, so almost 10, we had a relative frequency of 0 0.05. Okay, let's go ahead and graph that. So that's gonna go up ahead to about 0 0.05. And you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and fill in the rest of the numbers here actually. Oh, 
Okay, so let's go ahead and graph this. So from 8 to almost 9, it's 0 0.05. So from 8 to almost 9, boop, 0 0.05. And then from 9 to almost 10, it's also 0 0.05. But at 10, what happens? It jumps up to 0 0.1. So 0 0.1 right here, this is where it jumps up to. And that goes until almost 11. And then at from 11 to almost 12, it's 0 0.025, which is here. And then 12 to almost 13 is 0 0.15. Okay, you can go ahead and pause the video and try continue graphing this out on your own. All right, and 13 to almost 14 is 0 0.325. Whew, that's a lot higher, so it goes up to about here. 14, definitely not my best looking graph. And 15 to 15.99, oops, I skipped the 14. 14 to 14.99 is going to be 0 0.175, so almost at 20. Up to 15. And then 15, point, 15 to 15.99 is 0 0.075, so almost at 10. And then for 16, 0 0.025, back down again. And then starting at 17, there is nothing. And then also from 18 to almost 19 is also nothing. So nothing going on here. And then starting up again at 19 to almost at 20, we have 0 0.025. All right, there we go. That's our graph. What color do you think I'm going to color it in? Let's go red. Okay, so this one's kind of odd because it's an interval, remember? So you have to be aware of where it's starting and where it's ending when you're graphing. We have the little classes of data. All right. Objective five, draw leaf and, or stem and leaf plots. Leaf and stem, stem and leaf. Use the following data to create two different stem and leaf plots. And then we're going to compare them. So we're going to create a stem and leaf plot with one stem for the tens digits, twenties digits, and so on. Okay, so here's the data over here. And what we do is we're going to go ahead, draw in the f number of first, not first digits, tens, twenties, and thirties. Let's say we have ten. And now we go to twenties. We go into thirties. Do we go into forties? No. We're only in the tens, twenties, and thirties. So I'll go ahead and write that down. One, two, and three. Drawing in my line. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and highlight all of the tens in blue. Okay, those are all the tens in blue. Let's go ahead and write them down. Now when we do this, we're just going to write down the ones digits. So for the tens, we have a 13, so that'd be a 1, 3. Then we have a 14, it's a 1, 4. Actually, I need to write this down this side. We have a 13, a 14, an 11, ooh, and a 12. And then a 17. Ooh, before that, sorry, we have a 16, then 17, then 18, then 19. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this in order. For the 11, we're going to do a 1 for the 1's place, because we already wrote down the 10's place right there. And then we have 12, 13, 14, skip 16, sorry, skip 15, then we have 16, 17, 18, and 19. So notice, we just wrote down the 1's digits because these are placed into the 10's digit box. Right there is 10's digits. Oops. Tens digits. Okay. We don't actually want this around, and for some reason my back button won't let me hit back, so I needed to erase it. All right. Go ahead and try see if you can fill in the twenties and thirties. Okay, so for the twenties, I'm going to go ahead and highlight in red. 
29, again. Oh, we have some duplicates. That'll be interesting. And you actually, we're going to write down the duplicates as well. So the lowest we have is 20, right there. Then we have 21 and 21. And 23 and 23. 24, just one 24. And just one 25. 127. And two 29s. All right, so when we write that down, we include a zero for 20. And then we include two ones for the 21s, both 21s. Then two threes for both threes. We're supposed to be trying to line these up right here, which I'm failing at. So let me go ahead and try to line those other ones up. Lining that up, lining that up, lining that up. Okay, looks good. Then a four. Then a five. Then a seven. Then a nine and another nine. All right, let's go ahead and do the 30s. I'll use yellow. Oh, I forgot a 10. Darn. 10 right there. So that means this should be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. Let me erase that and rewrite that. Skipping the zero is not good. Zero, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, and then the threes. Let's hope I don't skip anything on this time with the threes. So the first one we see for threes would be 31. And then we have 32. And 33. 34. Ooh, which I see three times. One, two, three. Then 38, I see it two times. And 39, I see it once. So notice the way I wrote these out, it varies. So there are different methods for how you can write it out. Let's see. So 31, 32, 33. Four happens three times. One, two, three, four. 38 happens twice. Eight, eight. And then nine happens once. 9. Alright, so that's one way we can represent our data, seeing the frequencies of each of the different various ones, which actually, they're pretty similar in the amount of times they appear. Now we're going to go ahead and do the same thing, but create it using two different stems for the 10s, 20s, and so on. So what would that look like? Well, we're going to split the 10s into 10 to 14, and then 5 to 19. So let's take a look at that. So one and one, two and two, three and three. So once again, let's go ahead, tens digits in blue. Remembering that 10 this time. Okay, looks good. So tens digit in blue. First grouping is from 10 to 14. So we have, oops. 10, so a 0 there, then 11, 12, 13, 14, and then we stop with this group and we're going to continue on with the next one, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Now let's take a look at the 20s. Which color did I use before? Red for 20s. Right? Yeah. Okay, red for 20s. Alright. Once again, splitting it between 20 to 24 and then 25 to 29. So first we have 20. And 21, 
twice. And let's see, 23 also twice. Once again, remembering to line the numbers up. And 24. And then moving on for the 25s to 29s. We have a 25, a 27, and a 29 twice. All right, now let's go on to the 30s. And the 30s are going to go from 30 to 34, and then from 35 to 39. Okay, so starting, we don't have a 30, we have a 31, though. Then a 32. And a 33. And a 34. Three times. And a 38 twice. And that's in the new bracket. And then a 39 once. Alright, so notice this time the data does look a little different because we've split it up into more classes. Okay, so there's no such thing as a correct stem and leaf plot, but let's discuss which of the above two examples might be better. So the second example might be better because after we have split it up into more classes, you can see the frequencies of the distribution a little bit better. Um, split stems are, or sorry, stem and leaf plots are probably best used when we have a small amount of data because as you can see, we had a small amount of data and it took a while to graph this out. So the smaller amount of data you have, this is a probably a better method. If you start getting a large amount of data, not a good method to use. So for objective six, draw dot plots. Okay, so we're gonna draw a dot plot using the data per in the provided table, which is from our Wamanala feed supply customer chart. And we're gonna do this for number of customers. And those go from 1 to 8, as we said before. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so, ooh, ran out of room. 1, let's see if I do a better job this time. Okay, a bit better. So we're going to do a dot plot, which basically means you're going to be stacking dots for the number of times you see each number. How many times do we see the number 1? One? 1, 2. So we'll do 1, 2 dots for the number 1. Okay, you can pause the video and try to fill this one out by yourself. How many times does 2 appear? 1, 2, 3, 4 times. So we'll do one, two, three, four. And once again, we're looking for the frequency of data here. This is what we're looking at when you visually draw out a graph. Or you're looking for the distribution shape as well. And then three. How many do we see for three? One, two, three, four. Okay, so four of threes. One, two, three, four. Now fours. How many fours do we see? One. Two? Oh, just two fours. How many fives do we see? Just one. Sixes. One, two, three. Sixes. Sevens. Three sevens. And eights. Ah, just one eight. Okay, so this would visually help us to see where the highest distribution is. So what is a more common number of customers to see? It's more common to see two or three customers. So a nice way to visually show things. Probably not, I mean, actually it'd work pretty well with some larger sized groupings. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and practice identifying shape of a distribution. So shapes of distributions are really important. You often hear about them in statistics. And here are the main different ones that you might see. So the first one we have here, A, would be called a uniform distribution. Uniform, think same, same. Everything here is the same height. And this is called also symmetric. 
Now, the next one we have is probably one that's pretty familiar to you. It's starting to look a lot like one curve that everyone knows about statistics is the bell-shaped curve. So this one is called the bell-shaped distribution. Oops. And this one is also considered symmetric. The next two. These look a lot like the bell-shaped ones, but there is a slight difference. So the one here, where you notice, it looks a lot like a bell shape, but then something weird happens here on the left. This one would be called skewed left. And it is not considered symmetric. So it has extra stuff on the left-hand side, which would be, hence the name, skewed left. Now, using the same logic, here it looks like a bell shape, but there's some extra random stuff happening on the right this time. So this one is going to be called skewed right. So the, those are some of the basic shapes for distributions. Alrighty, so note. We do not describe qualitative data as skewed left, right, or uniform. The skewing left, right, or uniform is for quantitative data. So when we're looking at numbers. Second thing to note is to identify shape, some flexibility is required. Okay, so because, as mentioned before, statistics, these are done by humans. It's not perfect. People are looking at the data and deciding what they see from the data. People may disagree on the shape, since identifying the shape is subjective. Which is also why it's great to check on these stats that you might be telling other people. Look at the data and look at how they decided to interpret the data they found. All right, last objective. We're going to draw a time series plot from the given data on the number of animals adopted each month from the humane, humane society, not human society. All right, so we have each month and the number of pets adopted. Let's go ahead and label our graph here. So months. That would be January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. All right, and our numbers, they roughly go, let's do fives. Why not? Fives all the way up to 60. Can we fit that in? Let's do this. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, oops, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, and 70. We got a little off track here, but we can do it. So this is 20. Oops. 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, and 70. All right. Now let's go ahead and plot these. So one thing that's useful about a time series plot is that you can watch the trends of the data over time to determine any patterns that might be seen. Okay, let's go ahead and draw this in. So in January, 35 pets were adopted. 35. February, 48 were adopted. Almost 50. March, 20 were adopted. April, 41. May, 23. June, 38. Once again, you can pause this video and work on it by yourself. July, 26. August, 29. 
September 19. It's about there. Really sketch here. And then let's see, October 25. And November, ooh, shoots up to 55. And December, 68. Whew, almost 70. I wonder why so many animals would be adopted around Christmas time. Okay, so when you do a time series graph, a lot of times it would actually have to do with time. So you're going to go ahead and connect them for a time series graph. Now this one is definitely an example. Often time series graphs have to do with maybe perhaps um, number of cars sold over the time of year or maybe conflicts in countries over a certain period of years and different things like that. But here is an example of what it might be. So reading this example we might say it looks like during the summer months at the beginning of a school year, the amount of pets bought slows down. But it really takes off right before Christmas, which might make sense when you're thinking about people buying pets for Christmas. Okay, so once again, just sort of a simple example of a time series graph, but to give you a basic idea. All right, that is it for this section. Please email me if you have any questions about the homework.